Welcome to Privacy Abbreviated, brought to you by BBB National Programs. As our regular listeners know, our goal here is to help business leaders prepare and operationalize for what's next in the privacy space. I'm Donna Frazier, Senior Vice President of Privacy Initiatives at BBB National Programs. And once again, I'm joined by my co-host, Jason Kronk, Chair and Founder of the Institute of Operational Privacy Design. Jason, every, every time we do this, I say to you, where are you? What, what's going on? So where are you? What's going on? Yeah, thanks, Donna. I am I am right now in Florida. I have been here for uh, a little over a week, and I've got a couple more days here. Uh, I'm actually going to be slowing down my travels a bit, uh, though I do have uh, travels coming up to Europe. I'm going to the International Workshop for Privacy and Engineering, uh, giving a keynote there. Uh, I get to speak at CERN in Geneva, Switzerland, which is going to be exciting, and they're going to give me a tour uh, of the uh, uh, of their facilities. Uh, and then I'm going to PETS, Privacy Enhancing Technology Symposium in Lausanne, Switzerland. But once I get back from that, I should my travel should slow down, and I'll probably be in Florida for uh, most of the next couple of months. Okay. All right. Sounds good. So hopefully people have tuned into our, they tuned into our last podcast where our guests discussed the NIST privacy framework. And as we alluded to, the patchwork of privacy legislation on the state level is challenging at best for everyone that's impacted. And one such challenge that we are obviously all dealing with is the California's Consumer Privacy Act or CCPA. We could be here literally all day, all week, if we were to dissect all the challenges encapsulated in CCPA, but obviously we will not do that. We like our listeners way too much. Instead, we'll focus on one aspect of CCPA that really came to light and made everyone sit up and pay attention, and that was Global Privacy Controls, or GPC. In August of 2022, the California Attorney General's Office announced a settlement with Sephora, a multinational personal care and beauty products retailer. The settlement really resolved for us alleged violations, I want to be careful, alleged violations of CCPA for allegedly failing to disclose to consumers that the company was selling their personal information and to process user requests to opt out of sale via user-enabled global privacy controls, which we are here to discuss today. Companies are really still struggling to understand what GPC is as well as how to implement it. And we could not think of a better person to have with us today to dig into this topic. Yeah, so we'd like to welcome Jiwan Serrato, partner at Baker Hostetler Law Firm. Uh, among several roles she has at the law firm, uh, she is the head or co-lead of their U.S. consumer privacy practice. She has a deep understanding of U.S. and global privacy regulations, including CCPA, having represented Sephora in their case with California, which we'll be speaking about today. So welcome, Jiwan. Thank you very much, Donna and Jason. Very happy to be here. Thank you. So let's just jump right into it. What exactly is global privacy control? What is GPC? As you said, Donna, there are uh, so many different complexities and nuances to CCPA. And as Colorado, Connecticut, and you know Virginia, you know all of the other state laws uh, go come online, um, it's getting more and more complicated. I think what we can do is to apply some of the lessons learned from the CCPA enforcement and try to anticipate what we expect the Colorado AG to do. Uh, since the definition of sale in Colorado and Connecticut and Utah and, and Texas uh, moving forward in the next year are, are same or similar to the California definition of sale. Um, and for GPC, why do we talk about sale? It's because the GPC, the global privacy control, is understood to be one of the mechanisms by which consumers can opt out from sale. So that the two are really linked and related First, the businesses have to assess, is there a sale, uh, the broad definition of sale for California, Colorado, Connecticut, Utah, and uh, Texas? It's going to be not just for money, but for valuable consideration too. So it sweeps up targeted advertising. And so once you understand the, the broad definition of sale, then the business obligation is to respond to the GPC signal, global privacy control, as if the consumer has opted out of sale. So that's the simplest way of, of really kind of uh, thinking about it, that GPC is one of the ways by which consumers are able to opt out from sale. And so businesses have to first decide and determine a legal determination, is there a sale? If there is a sale, 
they need to respond to GP signals as if that's an opt-out request by a consumer. So, Xiuan, I'm really excited to have you here. Uh, there's uh, so much uh, going on in the space, and it's, and it's very convoluted. One of the things I think that might be helpful for our audience is, uh, c- can you disambiguate between GPC, the, the technical standard, and the user preference response requirement, I can't think of the, exactly what it's called, under the CCPA, uh, because they're, sometimes they're used interchangeably, which may lead to confusion to some people. Really good question. So I'm going to put all of the terms in one place so that hopefully this is helpful and it it clears up. So you're right. There are several terms floating around. The easiest way to think about it is there is the global privacy control. So if you go to the website, globalprivacycontrol.org, that is the website and you can scroll down and you can see the list of all the browsers and extensions uh, that allow for GPC. So this is the the, uh, capitalized GPC, right? The GPC. This is just one of many. There could be other technology tools that get developed and globalprivacycontrol.org could add additional GPC tools to the list of browsers and extensions that are acting as GPC. That, that capitalized GPC, however, is referred to differently in the state logs. So again, in Colorado, they refer to it as universal opt-out mechanism. And in California, they refer to it as opt-out preference signal. So from a, from a business perspective, what we have to understand right now, it's, it's all the same. Don't get confused by the terminology. Opt-out preference signal requirement in California is substantially same as the universal opt-out mechanism requirement in Colorado, which is basically right now the global privacy control, which is on the globalprivacycontrol.org. So if the business is trying to simplify things and just don't be overwhelmed, if current state, what the business must do is to look at the list of GPC browsers and extensions that are on the globalprivacycontrol.org page. So for example, Firefox, DuckDuckGo, Disconnect, Up Me Out, Privacy Badger, et cetera. That's on the list. Those are the privacy controls that the regulators, starting from California, are going to expect that the businesses respond to. That's it. Now, in January, January 1 of 2024, Colorado is expected to provide their list of what they consider to be, they're calling it the public list, the public list of what they consider to to be satisfying the universal opt-out mechanism test. But we don't have it yet, and it'll be sometime between now and January, we expect, because that's what the regulations say. And starting in July of 2024, Colorado will expect that businesses uh, respond to that list, that public list that Colorado will publish before January 1. But we're not there yet, right? So to the extent that we do not have that list that Colorado AG has presented, the best list that we have for figuring out what the business must do to respond to GPC is with the global privacy control, which is on globalprivacycontrol.org. Yeah, no, great, great explanation. Thanks for that. One of the main reasons we are here is because of uh, the Sephora case. Prior to Sephora, most businesses were not paying attention to uh, GPC. And in fact, I think still think most businesses probably aren't paying attention as they, as they should be. But can you give us a summary of what happened in the Sephora case? It was a settlement with the California AGs. What were the surprising aspects of it? And what should businesses expect as a result of that? Yes, absolutely. So first of all, I would like to dispel the myth that businesses are not working on GPC because we do get those calls a lot. I think the speed with which the businesses are asking for understanding the GPC and complying with GPC has has absolutely increased, especially after the Sephora settlement, as it should. And and the reason for that, as you said, Jason, is that the Sephora settlement uh, with the California AG really clearly laid out that uh, GPC is not an option. It's GPC is the legal requirement for complying with the California 
uh, Consumer Privacy Act, there was a lot of misunderstanding, I think, and some disservice done by some media reporting that GPC is not a current requirement, it's a future requirement. Some people thought it was a CPRA requirement. All of that was really dispelled with the Sephora settlement. So let me kind of spell out four lessons learned from the Sephora settlement that are really kind of ringing loudly and and widely the businesses should um, pay attention to. One is the definition of sale. I think there was previously a lot of confusion about what is and is not a sale and is the use of third-party cookies a sale or not. It should be really clear um, after the Sephora settlement because it was publicly reported and you can actually read the settlement. You can read the complaint which is not the allegations, as Donna said. So the the complaint is the alleged set of facts that the California AG put forward. The settlement is a document that I would point to because that's a document that the both parties agreed. California AG and Sephora agreed that these are the facts and therefore the changes that the company is going to make. So first, Lesson learned from the Sephora settlement that all businesses should pay attention to is the broad definition of sale, which I alluded to a little bit earlier. Second is once you do decide that you are engaged in targeted advertising, which falls under the definition of sale, you need to provide the right to opt out. And Sephora, at the time when the letter was received, and by the way, that is almost two years ago, right? So we're talking about a settlement about um, alleged violation that occurred you know, more than two years ago. So really, we're looking at it retroactively. So take a look at all the changes that Sephora has made and all the changes that all the other clients that we work with have made, right? So this might seem like a simple thing retroactively, but when the notice of uh, violation letter was, was provided to Sephora at that time, Sephora had taken a position that there was no sale and therefore there was no opt-out link. Those two obviously have been changed since then. So assess whether there's a sale, provide the the do not sell link and provide the right to opt out. Number three, when you do have a sale, it's not good enough to have a do not sell link. The business needs to respond to GPC. So that's the GPC response that we just talked about. GPC has to be one of the ways by which a consumer is able to exercise the right to opt out. It is very clear And if anybody has any questions about that, please let me know (laughs) because there are specific lines. There is an entire page in the California regulation that makes it very clear that an opt-out preference signal, a GPC, needs to be understood as a request to opt out. There is no question about it, and the businesses have to understand this is a legal requirement that's here to stay. It has been the requirement for more than two years. So that is, this is not something in the future. We have worked with several businesses in making the remediations regarding this fact. Fourth uh, lessons learned, uh, which uh, might be a little bit more nuanced, maybe not getting the headlines, is the, the contract. Not only do you have to give the right to opt out using that link, the footer in the website, and two, responding to GPC, but also you need to make sure that the service provider contracts are in place. That's the back end work. I think we have seen a lot of businesses put up a cookie suppression tool and think that that is done. That is not the full compliance program. You have to, if you are taking a position that certain cookies are service providers, you need to have the right contract in place. If you do not have the right contract in place, and oftentimes these cookies are on your website with no written contract, um, that's what we have learned um, as we are responding to these AG investigations. And so the fourth part, Part is the, to take a look at which contracts are in place for the list of the third-party online tracking technologies that are on your website and make sure the right contract is in place. If you're taking a position that certain cookies or online tracking technologies that are on your website are serving as service providers, if they are not, it's going to be a sale. And that's the way that the California AG will interpret it. And so that, that contract assessment is just as important as putting up a cookie suppression tool. Great. So thank you so much for going into great detail there. I'm sure that was very helpful to our listeners. Now, most of our listeners tend to be at small to medium sized companies, right? And obviously they want to grow. We want them to grow. And hopefully they're listening to our podcast to learn lessons that will help their companies grow. But there is a notion that, well, we know that CCPA may not apply 
to all companies, right? So I would, I would two-parter question, right? So which companies does CCPA apply to or not apply to? And then for those that are really trying to comply with it, what are some of the challenges that you're seeing? I think you laid out some of them, but I think that there may be some additional challenges that we that companies should be aware of. That's a really good question. And Donna, you bring up a, a question about scope. So California and all of the other states have a scope threshold. So if you are truly a small business and you are not meeting the threshold, I think you could make the argument that this law or, or the set of laws just do not, don't apply to you. We did get a lot of those scoping questions, threshold questions earlier you know, in the year. But I think at this point, I think most businesses have kind of gone past the scoping questions. And even the small and business, small and medium sized business, as you said, Donna, on all of them hope that they will be bigger one, one day. And and they do want to, you know, hit the threshold in terms of, you know, the revenue size and also the number of consumers. And so I think where most of the clients uh, end up is to to not fight on the scoping side, assume that these laws apply and and put these compliance mechanisms in place because it is very hard and expensive to do it retroactively, right? It's almost impossible to put these privacy controls in place after the data has already been collected. So when it is small, I would say, is when you should put these controls in place, it's much easier to do it up front than to do it retroactively. So now what does that mean? So I'm a small to medium-sized company and I don't want to boil the ocean. I want to right-size the compliance tools, but you know, I do want to do the right thing. If that's where you are, most of the small to medium-sized companies that we have worked with, they're not doing crazy things, right? So when you are talking about targeted advertising and you know the definition of sale, most of it is really going to be limited to cookie suppression. So working with whether it's third-party tool or it's working with you, Donna, and so coming up with a solution for the consumers to be to be able to opt out from cookies, that's the first step. That's one way to address the the target advertising restrictions that are coming your way in terms of these privacy laws. Having said that, here are some facts that we have seen that would get you out of uh, just the cookie suppression world and into CRM marketing world. If you are a retail company and you have, you are acting as a publisher, you are working with the retail media network, that is not going to be addressed by a simple cookie suppression. The data that you have exchanged with the retail media network needs to come into the scope of this sale discussion. If you are also a retail company or other web-based technology company and you have a referral program, we have seen those facts where let's say it's a credit card offer or your customer data is being exchanged with another third party and you have some kind of a kickback for referral of that customer to that third party. Those referral programs, whether it's credit card programs or other third party joint marketing programs, that also is are going to fall under the the broad definition of sale and will not be addressed by cookie suppression. So those are some high level facts that we have run into in terms of doing the sales analysis. And so I would say, you know, my first recommendation is to engage counsel is to identify the activities that would fall under this definition of sale figure it out, and then we can help you come up with a solution. Coming up with a solution, I think, is easier. The first step and you know, the most important step is really identifying what is the universe of sales activities. Once you figure out the sale of data, uh, you know, the sharing of, of data that constitutes a sale from a, a legal perspective, then you can work out the, the technology. And, and I think you, you said, and I'm not, I'm trying to paraphrase here, that it was easy. So you mentioned earlier that when somebody receives the GPC signal, they should respond to it or consider that an opt-out of the sale of, of data. Uh, but obviously the sale of data d- doesn't happen through through cookies and targeted advertising and sharing with service providers on the front end. There may be sharing, you know, if you've made that determination on the back end, people may come back 
and be logged into the system and not have be sending the GPC signal. So there's a lot of back and forth. Then there's a case if somebody fills out your normal form and says, don't sell my data, and then they come and they don't have the GPC signal turned on. There seems like there's a lot of back and forth. And I don't know if there's, I haven't seen the technological infrastructure for that kind of sharing of when somebody has opted out and all of the different points at which you're sharing to understand that that person has opted out of the sharing. Uh, are you seeing something simpler than I am or, or am I missing something or what, what's, what's going on there? It seems, seems fairly complex to me. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I don't want the listeners to walk away thinking that this is simple. It is, it is complex. What I do want the listeners to know is that this is possible. I think a lot of people get overwhelmed and say, we just don't know how. And I think we've actually heard that from some of the vendors. And so what I would say is ask, you know, ask your outside counsel, do you, have you done this work and ask your vendor tool, have you done this work? And if they say no, then you need to find another vendor or outside counsel that knows how to do this work, right? That I think is definitely something to take away is that we now have over three years of experience implementing this. So this is not a black hole. You know, this is not a theoretical, you know, we have a lot of experience having worked with with the California AG in implementing GPC. We know exactly what the regulators expect. We know what the law says, and we know where the Colorado AG is going in terms of the implementing regulations. And so none of this should be a surprise to the businesses. It's a matter of say finding the right tools, the technology tools and the partners and the right outside counsel they can that they can uh, you know shed light. So you're, you're absolutely right in terms of the complexities of how to respond to GPC. GPC, first of all, is browser-based and device-based, right? And what does that mean is that if I am a consumer and I am using this particular device and using this particular browser and I'm not logged in, there is no way a business can tell that this person is Juan, right? All you can see is this browser on this device has a GPC turned on. Now that changes when I am logged in. So let's say I'm working, I'm on the retail website and I'm logged in. So now you have a name and an email and maybe a phone number attached to that person. And you can tie the GPC signal from that browser and that device to that account. So the California AG has taken... I think there's over a page long regulations, and we've had numerous conversations with the AG talking about this difference and really educating the, the regulators about the logged out consumer experience versus the logged in consumer experience. So you'll see directly written in the regulations what we have discussed with the AG, which is what the businesses are required to do for logged out consumers versus what you have to do for logged in consumers. The expect, I mean, the regulators know that there is a difference uh, in, to, in terms of what you can do for identified consumers versus what is not, you know, who is not identified. One more thing is the concept of who is an identified consumer, however, is changing. I think the regulators are pushing on that. Who is a known consumer for you, for your website, and who is not a known or who is not an identified consumer for you? It really is. There is no one size fits all. I think you need to really engage with the business to understand how you're identifying the consumer and ultimately how the sale is occurring. It is really based on how the sale is occurring that the, the response mechanisms have to address the particular sale that's occurring on that website for that business. Right. Well, that was the, the, the follow-up I was going to ask is, is you talk about logged in versus not logged in, but I, I've seen a lot of companies spend a lot of effort trying to individually identify individuals to do cross-device synchronization. So your TV knows that it's you because you're logged into your phone and there's like sounds going through the air that, that are subsonic. So you can't hear it, but your TV can hear it. So it knows that it's you. I mean, there's all sorts of, of things that they can do to fingerprint people. But I think it, what you suggested, uh, it sounds like, is the regulator is aware of that. And, and so that that logged in difference may not be the, the deciding point. 
Yeah, really good. And that's a really good example in terms of cross-device tracking, right? So my first question is going to be, what are you using the data for? Are you really doing that fingerprinting across device? So let's say this is a smart home example. I think that's where you were going, Jason. So let's say you have a smart refrigerator and a smart TV and your you know, smart thermostat and your mobile device, you know, which you know, ties it all together. Um, are you collecting all the data from all the devices and putting it under one single profile? Right. So let's say, you know, Juwan with uh, Juwan at gmail.com. And then that's the profile. And that's the profile that I log in to control all of my devices for my smart home management. And this business is collecting all the device information. So how many times I open the fridge and, you know, what temperature I like to have my you know, thermostat at. All of the data is collected at the individual level and used for targeted advertising purposes. Then, yes, the regulator will expect you right, to, to be able to apply the opt-out if the data is used for target advertising purposes and there is a third party that the, the company is using for that advertising purposes. So to the extent that the cross-device data is collected for the purposes that trigger sale and you can identify the person, you know, that ties all of the devices, yes. But let's say you can't. Let's say that there is no one profile that links them all and there is no one consumer profile. There's no single. And we have a lot of those examples, too. And I'm I'm assuming, Donna, many of your small to mid-sized companies, they're going to say we don't even have a CRM. Right. We don't have a good way. We would love to. Um, I have I have those questions. And I, I personally, I would love to help a business create a centralized database. You know, they usually do not have one CRM database. They would love to have one single view of a customer. And so we do help companies create that kind of one customer view so that they can optimize the data. But a lot of the single, uh, small to medium size don't even have it to begin with. So that's that's what I mean, is that it really kind of depends on how sophisticated your advertising programs are. And if you're not creating this single customer view and you're not using it for um, target advertising purposes, then the sale of the obligations will not apply either, right? Since you're not doing it. Yeah. So, so uh, Donna and I were having a conversation before this, this call and, and she asked a, a question, which I, I don't know the answer to. And, and forgoing what you just said about the, you know, cross device and, and, you know, one customer profile, let's assume your small business, all you have is a mobile app. Right. And it's not a browser based mobile app because you mentioned before GPC was a browser signal. I, I mean, assuming the law is still applicable if you if you get some kind of signal. But right now, like Apple and Google don't have any kind of, of signaling uh, that you can turn on to your phone. Is that that correct? Uh, that would go through a mobile app? Yeah, that's right. That's our understanding. So the GPC right now is browser based, so it only applies to web. So we have not had any enforcement actions by the California AG where they expect the GPC to apply to the mobile app. Having said that, it changes if the mobile app has an account, right? And the same account is used on the web. Or let's say the mobile app is allowing for web browser. So you can have a mobile web browser where you are going to a certain business website and it's a mobile website. So it depends on how the mobile app is being used and how the advertising works on the mobile app. But in terms of the global privacy control that we talked about, that is right now web-based and browser-based only. What you just brought up is a fascinating thing because a lot of mobile apps it, for additional functionality will will bring up, I, I, I'm not using the technical term here, but an internal web browser that uses the web browser of the phone. And so I could see a mobile app that generally would be ignorant. It's like, oh, I don't know about GPC because I'm a mobile app. And then all of a sudden they pull up some functionality read the privacy policy and it pulls up the web page uh, internal to the app. And now the app has awareness of that. Uh, you know, oh, I, I don't even want to think about that. <laughs> Donna, I'll turn it over to you at this point. So, I, I mean, I, this is this is also fascinating and I think helpful for companies. So the other side of it is about the consumers, right? And one thing that we're always talking to companies about is what is the impact of what you're doing, obviously, on your consumers? Here, it sounds as though... Um, Consumers may not fully understand if there's something they actually need to do. Like, what what do you think consumers actually understand about what it means to opt out, what the ability to opt out of a sale actually means, and how should companies actually help that? How how do they inform and educate? Really, really good point, Donna. I think 
the place to start is to really kind of think about what these rights mean. These rights are opt-out rights, meaning this has to be an action that the consumer takes, right? So as far as how the U.S. privacy laws are going, the trend right now is the consumer has to take the action to opt out. And how do they do that? They do that by going to the bottom of the footer of the website and clicking on the do not sell link and then filling out the opt-out form. That's one way that they opt out. Second way that they can opt out is by using the browser or the extension, let's say DuckDuckGo or any of the, the GPC-enabled browser and extension. Opt Me Out is one of the popular ones, Privacy Badger, et cetera. So they are using a privacy browser or an extension that allows for the GPC. And, and they are turning it on, right? So a consumer is taking the, the next step to use the browser and to say, yes, I would like to opt out. So this is not something that is automatically done, right? So when a business is thinking about responding, we are really responding to the consumers that have taken the time and the attention to use the browser and to turn on these signals. And so they have taken an action to opt out using GPC. So the regulator expectation and the legal expectation is the businesses have to honor it. Businesses have to be able to respond to the GPC signal that is being sent by that consumer through that browser and through that extension as if they have used a do not sell link on the website. So that's why, again, for the mobile app, that browser and, uh, and the extension that we just talked about, it, it doesn't work in a mobile app setting. Just as an aside, we took this idea from inside the actor studio, which some listeners may be familiar with. And there's a list of questions that they ask at the end of interviews. And don't think too much about it. We'll go back and forth and I'll ask you the first question, which is, what is your favorite word? Create. I would say create is my favorite word. Privacy can be seen as the the team of no, (laughs) right? And so I think I really try to be a business partner to build and to create instead of thinking of privacy as uh, something that's restrictive to really kind of think about it in terms of how to build privacy into to the larger discussion and how to make that be a, an enabler for the business rather than something that comes as a you know, hindsight. Yeah, something I often say is, I don't want to be the no, please. I want to get you the yes. That's the yeah, exactly right. So, and then the other side of that, what is your least favorite word? I think the word that I would go with is friction. I think there is this kind of false thought out there that it's either privacy or security, or it's either innovation or it's privacy, you know, and so... When you have these, it's large, bet the company type of uh, data strategies, it absolutely has to be a team sport. And, you know, everyone has to kind of get in the, the boat and start rowing the same way. And when different groups have different requirements or goals or missions, and they don't really kind of talk the same language, I think it can really kind of work to the detriment of the, of the business. So that's what I'll go with. All right. So last question. If any problem in the privacy landscape could be solved for tomorrow, what would you want it to be? I think the problem that the new laws and the regulators are really interested in is proliferation. That's what I'm hearing most. It's the, it's the deep distrust of data being collected by multiple sources and being used and, and the consumer's not having control over it. it it's this, this, this sense of distrust combined with lack of control and the status quo being proliferation, uh, unlimited proliferation. And I'm not sure that there is a way to solve it um, other than that I think the time has come I mean, we're not going to move away, right? It's not like proliferation is going to go away. And as much as I try in terms of responding to regulator concerns about the distrust part of it, you know, which, you know, we can work on by having good controls internally, but it's not a one kind of quick fix. I would say is I think all of us are trying to work on that, right? I think all of us as privacy lawyers are looking to, to have businesses be responsible 
and to have laws and regulations restrict behaviors that hopefully will make the human interaction with technology and the, the massive collection of data in the future be responsible so that, that we can address these fears and, and uh, inherent distrust. Jiwan, again, thank you uh, for for giving us this insightful information on GPP uh, and, and circling the square and bringing it back to the NIST privacy framework there at the end. It was wonderful having you. Yeah, thank you so much, Jiwan. We really do appreciate your insights and time. And I know that you are working, you are so busy with all of your clients dealing with all that sort of stuff. So we appreciate you really taking time out of your schedule to do this. Thank you, Donna and Jason. This was a pleasure. Well, I want to thank everybody for listening to us today. As always, if you missed any of our previous episodes, please check them out at accountabilitystudios.org, your Apple podcast, or wherever you find your podcast. And be sure to please leave us a review and let us know what you'd like to hear next on Privacy Abbreviate. Thank you so much. Bye.